So this presentation is about why I don't use microservices in quite a few of the projects I tend to work on. And I'm going to go through a couple of particular case studies of things I'm working on right now um, that just are not microservice appropriate. And, and trying to do that kind of would make them fail. Uh, um, I've got to figure out how to advance the slide. Enter, point, click. Oh, next slide. How about that button? Okay. Um, that was a backwards button. Sorry, let's go forwards. We can't see your screen yet. You can't see my screen. No. All right, sorry. Let's back to. So our technical difficulties are still in place. Camera's on, camera off, camera on. I'm in present mode. Yep. yep. Yeah, I'm already in present mode, so that seems to be working. Yes, we, yes, we can see your slides now, or rather your screen now. Good. Still seeing it? Yes. Still seeing it? Still seeing it? Absolutely, yep. Ah. All right. Um, so this is just a little bit about me. So one of the things you can see is I'm very old. Um, but the other thing is kind of more on the, on the right side, and that is I tend to work in new technologies um, on the bleeding edge. So a lot of things I talk about sometimes are not appropriate for you right now, but the chances are in the next five years you'll get to do these things. Um, so I want to talk about sort of requirements uncertainty um, because as I see various projects over the years, especially around Y2K, there's some things that are really certain about that and some uncertainty. Um, and if you, have, if you have actually perfectly good requirements and everything's kind of known, Waterfall actually works pretty well. I mean, we, I deliver systems for you know, a quarter of a century using Waterfall technology successfully. Um, it turns out, though, Agile lets you have a little less certainty yet still possibly deliver. And this was kind of really cool because now I can sort of start out doing something a little quicker and sort of let the new requirements flow in. But the problem was always that if the requirements are really kind of more uncertain, then basically you will be unsuccessful. So either you build the wrong thing or the customer says, that's not what I really wanted, or you can't figure out how to deliver it at all. So a lot of promises made, a lot of things failed. So I kind of figured that to be the graveyard. Um, but over time, I began to understand that there's some differences here. Um, so there's kind of fuzzy problems and there's traditional problems. And I'm using, uh, sorry for the graphics, but I'm using the Kinevin model from a deck guy named Dave Snowden. Uh, some great YouTube videos from him about how this really works. But he says problems are either simple or complicated. Where simple problems, the cause and effect relationship is very straightforward. But for complicated problems, the cause and effect relationship is more convoluted. So it kind of takes an expert to figure that out. But he didn't stop there. He says there are also problems that are complex and chaotic. And a complex problem is one where the cause and effect relationship can't be figured out. Even though you'd like to think it exists, it really doesn't. And so you see things like uh, uh, financial markets. When people say, I can predict what the financial markets are going to do, they're just kidding themselves because it doesn't really have that cause and effect relationship. It is a complex product. And chaotic means I have no idea what's going on at all. Um, and just because a problem is complex doesn't mean it can become complicated. Uh, complex is complex and tends to stay complex. Uh, Complicated just means maybe I need an understanding of it. So for an example is a complicated problem would be something like, um, you know, figuring out financial transactions. There's the rules about how you figure out financial transactions. A complex problem is be one that says, well, what share should I buy? Well, that's complex. There's no rules about, about how you make money in that environment. If there were, people would have already solved it. So it turns out these problems are radically different than each other. And therefore, you tend to organize differently to solve them. So for a simple problem, our very traditional organization structures work, work really well. I, 
the idea is the manager's there and telling the people what to do and, and trying to make them work faster and better and fewer errors. And there's managers and managers training how the managers work. So a very traditional structure. So a call center, this would be a, a perfectly good structure for that. For complicated, though, you've got to have some experts that understand the domain. The problem is, of course, experts are expensive. And so basically what you need to do is you put a team together to do what the expert tells you to do. This actually describes more traditional Agile quite well, where the experts are going to tell you the, what the stories are and prioritize the stories for you. And the team is responsible for delivering the stories that the experts are looking for. So again, a really nice structure that works really well for solving complicated problems. And again, a structure I use quite a bit. The problem with complex is there's no one who can tell you what the answer is. There are no experts. There's only people who are trying things out. In fact, there's no real good role for a manager either because the manager can't tell you what to do either because he doesn't know. Uh, it's all about experimentation and trying things out. And of course, that's a very, very different organization structure and a very, very different process associated with that. So if you look at sort of these, these requirements uncertainty, one of the things you realize is you can do some of these things that we where they used to be in the graveyard, but I would call them fuzzy. But there are ways to actually implement fuzzy problems. But you got to realize these are different problems and they require different approaches. So for a more traditional agile structure, stories are a really wonderful thing to do. You put the specialists in place to understand the, how to do these things. Uh, you do so you TDD, you put your acceptance test in place, write your migration scripts, and all that stuff works really well. But in the fuzzy world, it's about idea-focused features. It's about ideas. What's the idea? We don't know what this, we don't have a story because we don't know what works. We don't, that's why we have to experiment. So we have ideas. And these ideas are implemented very quickly, so you need a full-stack developer who can do it all, not just hand it off to somebody else to do pieces of it. Because the faster I can experiment, the more successful I am. And so you want a system that actually realizes when things are working poorly, you know, KPIs are being collected, so you know when things are working and not working because, again, you don't know what the right answer is yet. And this is where microservices fit very, very well. They're highly decoupled. They let us try ideas out aggressively. Uh, they're easy to deploy, and we can have multiple versions running at the same time. And then you use an event-based architecture to really keep the decoupling working well. So different techniques to solve different types of problems. And of course, you do a continuous deployment. So I've been working recently uh, with the Norwegian National Benefits. Um, so I'm actually in, in Oslo right now working on this for the last year. And what I found in this environment is that they are just starting to hire programmers in the last few years. So they, they used to outsource everything. Now they're actually bringing their programmers in-house. So they got some really good programmers. The programming talent is, is surprisingly strong, uh, but they're new to this organization, and the organization is kind of new for them. They're actually quite, in, as an organization, they're very inexperienced in how to run products, you know, how to run projects and product uh, management stuff. But they are committed to Agile. They're just not sure what that means when they said it. So I worked on several projects. Um, we'll talk about each one of these in turn. Uh, one is a sickness benefit. In Norway, you can get up to 52 weeks of sickness benefit paid by the government uh, if you're sick for an extended amount of time. Uh, and if you're sick, sick longer than a year, you can move into disability, which gives you some, several more years of benefits. Uh, so a very pop, a very strong benefit. And of course, we now have the unemployment benefit as well. So if you're unemployed, you can get up to a year or two years, depending upon your salary level of unemployment benefits. And then on top of all this, you throw in that we had, in the middle of all this COVID-19 hit, which obviously has great implications to sickness and great implications to unemployment. And so all of a sudden, our caseworkers were completely swamped with work. So this is the environment we we're working in. So how do we address this sort of problem? Well, the first of all, you sort of look at the team. The team in the sickness benefit case had been on the job for about six months. Um, they got some good domain knowledge, so they began to understand what, what sickness benefit's all about and what the rules are associated with that. But they're frankly a little bit, um, they were fragmented. They were sort of working on the individual pieces, hoping it would all integrate together at some point but no one's really focused on the integration. No one really had a vision of how the overall thing would work eventually. 
So no vision of how to get there. They were working on the individual pieces. Again, sort of lack of, frankly, business leadership. So what we did there was we basically decided we need to sit back and decide how we want to build the overall system, the ultimate system, what it looks like, and start building the pieces that fit into that overall system and make sure they integrate as we build it. So we organized the concept around we want to make a continuous delivery. We want to deliver something constantly, something that somebody can use at least to some degree. So we kept going with that. Um, we actually put in the agile processes that were pretty much pure extreme programming. So we did TDD, we did pair programming, sometimes mob programming. Um, we would have continuous deployments. Uh, we would push, push to GitHub and constantly deploy that. In fact, we're probably running right now uh, around 12 to 14 de deployments a day uh, into, into production, uh, into live running systems. Contrast that to going back a couple of years. We did some analysis a couple of years ago with these benefit stuff. The organization as a whole would, would probably once a, about in a month, we would probably deploy six or seven new systems a month. Uh, now we're doing that in a few hours for one system. Uh, the other thing we need to do is create some business vision. We need to lay out what the epics were, the, what the features were we're trying to build, and the stories and sort of a roadmap of how we got there. So how do we architect this thing? Well, the first thing we realize is um, the rules associated with the sickness benefit are come from the law. Uh, and the law does not change very often. This is actually a complicated problem. Yeah, the law is complicated, but there's nothing fuzzy about the law. And so you sort of read the law and you sort of see what sort of rules they have associated with it. They talk about making payments. So we created an object called a payment period. And the payment period should be, you know, no more than 30 days because we like to cut you a check at least once every 30 days if you're sick. And the idea that, you know, that there were certain rules about what it means to be sick. Well, we built ourselves a timeline that says, OK, what day are you sick? And now how sick are you? And and what sort of job were you doing at the time when you got sick? So very obvious sort of concepts behind this that, frankly, very traditional programming technology can model very nicely. And that's what we wind up doing. In fact, currently in the law, we probably have about 320 concepts we model and over 3,000 assertions that we constantly run. Take about, take about 20 seconds to run the 3,000 assertions, making sure that we haven't broken one of, the, one of the things we put into the system. But the nice thing about the system is the law is relatively stable. Uh, law changes really slowly. Uh, so we, we, we're not going to be pushed to do the models. We wanted to model the law quite clearly. What does change all the time is where all the information comes to fill in the law. So we wanted to isolate that from the, from the law itself. So we used the traditional mediator pattern. We put ourselves sort of a, a mediator slash controller between us and the rest of the world. So the law only talks to the mediator and mediator feeds stuff to the law in the format the law loves to see. But the mediator is responsible for sort of turning everything into a sort of law format for us. So, for instance, we get a lot of documents coming in, documents from the doctors, documents from the employee, documents from the company, all about, you know, the sickness and how much they're getting paid and how long they've been on vacation, all the information flowing in. And frankly, most of the times this, this information is in pretty much in sort of garbage format. Oops, I just lost my screen. I lost a lot of my screen. Uh, am I back? Anyway, I hope so. So the uh, we're getting external information. The other thing we're getting constantly is uh, we, we need to run off to legacy systems to get other information because there's other information we need to collect. We go to the tax authority and see how much money you're making who, and who you work for. We need to go see what your sickness history is because we have a limit of how many sick days we pay across a three-year period. We only pay 248 sick days across a three-year period. So we got to see what you used to be sick. Um, and we got to see if you're getting some other benefits. Uh, other benefits, for example, being things like, uh, are you getting a, a child, child care benefit? Are you getting um, uh, some other vacation benefit? So we have to check those things. And finally, one of our other key sources of information is, in fact, our caseworkers. Because our caseworkers need to look at your file, look at everything going on, and see if you indeed do, do indeed qualify for sickness benefit. 
So for that, we just built ourselves a little task manager. So if the mediator decides this information has to be gotten from the caseworker, we just send something over to the task manager. He puts a task out in a database for, for the caseworkers to pick up. And that's how the system works. So you look at the system and what problem we're trying to solve, and there's no need for your know, elaborate you know, service-oriented architecture with you know, tons of microservices. The law is very straightforward, easy to model with techniques we've done for the last 30 years. The mediator is a well-worn pattern for that. We are using new technology in some ways. We got a Kafka bus there separating us from the world, which is kind of cool. Um, but the idea of a task manager, you know, putting to a relational database that these are things that, you know, caseworkers need to handle and deadlines for handling them, very traditional application. And we built it in that fashion. The only place we use microservices is when we are working to the outside world, knowing the outside world always is kind of volatile. So we want to make sure each one of these is different for each outside world interface. So we have one per outside world interface. They're responsible for making sure they get the information in a timely fashion and any retries necessary. Some of these outside services we have, uh, they don't work on weekends. So the service doesn't decide it doesn't work and needs a weekend as well. So one of the things we have to worry about is, you know, waiting long enough for that to pop back up again. So wait till Monday morning, then ask the question and get the data back to us. So again, a very traditional structure. So again, uh, we're using new technology, but, you know, we're only using a little bit of microservices. We're writing everything in Kotlin. Uh, my, my feeling right now is if you're, if you're still writing Java code, you're uh, making a gigantic mistake for your organization. Uh, Kotlin is way better than that and very compatible to all the Java code you have. We are using multiple Kafka buses. Um, we're using a messaging sort of based interface. So we, we send messages to other services. Um, services send messages into us. So we're, we're basically using Kafka buses very aggressively instead of RESTful interfaces. Our UI is built with React. Um, and there is some microservices, but mostly for the purpose of externally isolating uh, things that we don't have control over and keeping that ugliness away from our, our core system. So in conclusion about that, one of the sickness benefit didn't need microservices. Uh, as much as they kind of thought they would like to play with those things, it just is not appropriate. And partly because the domain itself is, is stable because it's law and, and the law is well-defined. So there is no kind of fuzzy in this sort of situation. And these concepts can be, these fuzzy, these non-fuzzy concepts can be modeled very easily with objects. And we'll put some flexibility in the UI because we know that changes a lot. We, we eventually want to support mobile interfaces, for example. But the back-end law should not have to change for that. So again, that's our conclusions associated with that is, frankly, it's not fuzzy, so I didn't need that. So don't try to do that. And we didn't try to do that. We avoided it. All right, and so now we moved on to uh, unemployment benefits, and you're going to get a little feeling deja vu because it is the same organization. Uh, in this case, the team had been on a project more than 12 months. Uh, again, the good domain knowledge. They'd actually try to use microservices. Um, they were in. They attended one of my classes about microservices and thought that would be an appropriate architecture for themselves. And it turns out it did work for all the easy stuff, but it didn't do the hard stuff at all. And so they did all kind of did all the easy stuff and kept running across the hard stuff and saying, well, we don't know how to solve this. And again, the problem was we probably shouldn't have been using microservices. Uh, again, little, very little vision about what the ultimate system looks like. Um, again, to some degree, immature leadership on the, on the business side of, of the company as well. So again, almost the same deja vu. Well, let's create a cohesive architecture. Let's build continuous delivery. Uh, let's put these rigorous agile processes in place. Uh, for example, we're almost using exclusively mob programming in te small teams of four to six uh, doing mobbing. Uh, and we want to we go we need to go back and create you know epics and, and stories that sort of capture the overall domain. And that's still a work in progress. From the architecture perspective, uh, again we have law, uh, a lot of law associated with this. Um, probably just as complicated as the other law, um, but different in many ways. But one of the things this law is quite clear on is about decisions. How do you make decisions? 
Um, so you make a decision based upon a rules and some facts. Take some facts, apply some rules, and make a decision. Uh, in legal terms, it's called a subsumption. Uh, and so it turns out that's what we want to model. We want to model the concept of decisions based upon facts. And based upon these facts and decision, maybe I make I have to make another decision based on other facts. Or if it's not true, maybe I go into a different direction. So you wind up with this tree of decisions based upon these facts. And the law pretty much specifies what these decisions are, and even to some degree, the order in which you need to make these decisions. That's all very nice for the law, but that law doesn't make necessarily sense for a person trying to apply for the benefit. Because some of these facts are, are coming from other sources. So we create another structure called a case. So your application turns into a case, a case that we're working in deciding should you get unemployment benefits or not. So in this case, we actually model this as these are the facts that make sense grouped together. Like these facts all come from the system. We can look up your birth date. We can look up your employment history. We need those facts for the law purposes of the law, but I can get these facts by running you know, calls to various systems we already have in place. But there are other things that the applicant needs to provide. So those facts go into a different sections. They put those in, in different sections associated with the applicant. So these facts are associated with um, things we need to know, like what day would you like employment benefits for? When did you lose your job? Um, do you have children? Uh, are the children less than 18 years old? There's a whole raft of other questions and other facts we need to collect in order to make these decisions. And it turns out in our mapping, um, the various web pages associated with this, depending on where you're going to, each section probably is a corresponding web page that solicits this information. So you'll have lots of sections associated with applicant. You may have lots of sections associated with system. And there'll be another section associated with the caseworkers, things they have to approve. So the way the systems work is basically an applicant will come in and say, I would like to have a new case. So we will instantiate this case object with all these facts in it, but these facts don't have values yet. And then we'll go run over to the law and say, law, what sort of facts do you need first? And the law would say, well, this first decision requires these two facts. So we send those facts back over to the case. He looks through his facts and say, oh, that, that, these are system facts. I'm going to go off to a legacy system and get these for you. I'll fill in the values for you, and I'll go back to the law and say, hey, law, okay, know it now in these facts, what do you need to know now? I'll say, okay, well, now I need to know these facts. Back to the case. He figures out what section it is. Perhaps this section says I need this data from the applicant. So we'll pop a screen in front of the applicant, say, can you fill us, tell us about these things? So it's a ping-ponging back and forth. Now, the separation of sort of this UI grouping in the case from the law allows us to have different groupings for the case. We can, in fact, build a case version that would work on a mobile, where you have very few things on a per-page basis, versus a, maybe perhaps a view that may be a more power user who wants to basically fill in things aggressively uh, from other sources. So he may have a bigger web page with more facts into it, a you know, power user version of it versus a wizard use. So again, by, by modeling it this way, we don't have those connections. Now, as you look about this code, again, there's nothing about microservices. Uh, the problem is not a fuzzy problem. The problem in this case is very concrete. Um, it does have some volatility about you know, different UIs in the future, but we've isolated that from the law engine. Uh, and model it completely separately. So again, you don't need microservices. Uh, we have stable and well-defined law again. Concepts are modeled with objects and we have great flexibility in UI to sort of recode the case to be a version of case for a mobile user or for perhaps a web user. So two projects, um, there will be a few microservices here like the, in the other case, we haven't quite got to those yet. Um, but again, no need for microservices for solving a very traditional problem. Uh, by the way, all this code we're writing is open sourced. Um, the Nor Benef all the Norwegian benefits code is published in GitHub and it's open uh, to, be, to be read and studied. Uh, so kudos to Norway in taking a very progressive attitude about that. Uh, so I can talk about the code and I can use it in my next project, which will be very handy. Um, 
So it comes back to this picture. So this is the picture I use with my clients to, as I sort of listen to them, what problems they're trying to solve. And I'm putting their problems into the appropriate boxes. Uh, almost all clients will have some in several of these boxes. For example, a bank will have a lot of very complicated problems to solve. Um, you know, working working in how you do your balances and how you take your money and invest it and how you get your returns and how you calculate your interest and compound your interest and, and ask for loans to be repaid. All that stuff is very, very complicated, but they're very specific rules. But the bank also has complex problems that says, should I loan you money? Should I raise your credit limit? Um, should I do something else like that? Those are complex problems. And... Uh, in the case of the benefit stuff, we do have a few complex problems, like we would like to sort of check for fraud. Is somebody cheating us in our sickness benefit? Is, the, is their employer their uncle? And he's claiming he's sick, and he agrees with he's sick. Uh, where is your doctor, your cousin? And he's, he's filling his paperwork out. So we, do, are going to, we are building sort of a complex engine to go run sort of fraud processing and provide input to us. But that part is being done as a separate system because it is complex and it's doing being done in microservices. So first of all, figure out what type of problem you're trying to solve and make sure you're using the right technology. A lot of problems we're trying to solve and still solve today are complicated problems. Don't get sucked into microservices necessarily. It's, it's too hard to get it working in that environment. So that's the story about why I don't use microservices. Um, even though they're a lot of fun, um, even though they create their own intellectual challenges, uh, it's not doing my client any good services to use microservices when it doesn't make sense. All right, Fred. Thank you for that. Uh, I think this is uh, very good advice. So if it's not doing justice, if you're solving a complicated problem, then don't, you don't really need the complexity of uh, microservices. Yeah, it, certainly you will find that, first of all, it's, it's new to programmers. It's new to the architects. Um, and there's a large learning curve associated with sort of getting over that. And so definitely invest in that learning curve if you need it for a complex problem. But if you just have a complicated problem, don't do microservices. Um, you're, you're, you're sort of heading yourself off into more trouble than, you can, than it's worth. No. And you also kill the kill the thirst for microservices overall. You'll you'll kill the use proper use of microservices. One other interesting thing I saw is uh, you're kind of using the Canarian uh, framework, and you're trying to basically uh, maybe even separate out your systems uh, by uh, deciding what kind of uh, domain they belong to and maybe separate them out so that you could use microservices for the complex pieces. And for the rest of the stuff, you could use something simpler or more traditional in that sense. Yes. Uh, and, I, and that's like we always want to decompose our systems that way, that we want to decompose our systems so that we're looking at them as, as, as small pieces that kind of make sense. And then you want to make the judgment about the Kinevin model based upon that piece. Uh, but be, be aware that the process you use for the complex stuff still needs to be different than the complicated. Uh, I had a, a client I was working with in London, you know, several years ago, who basically had three separate team structures assorting what they were trying to do. They had a very traditional retail back end because they're a store, um, and a very traditional system doing that, and a very traditional team doing that with very specific roles. You know, they had architects and designers and back ends and front ends. Then they had some things they were trying to enhance into that system. They were using a very traditional agile team. And then they had some the wild and crazy guys who were putting kiosk out saying, you know, oh, look, I, I, I like these pair of jeans, but you don't have my size. So you just go to this kiosk, you scan your jeans, and you tell what size you want, and it gets mailed to you. Those guys were shipping something new in production every three or four days. So they were, they were toying with the things because they were experimenting. Three different teams, three different organization structures. No. Don't try to, to have one size fit all. No. That's the very essence of Agile in some sense. Yeah, Agile should be Agile. And it's actually Agile on a team basis, not at a company level. Cool. 
All right. Uh, thanks, uh, Fred. That was awesome. Uh, also, just for the benefit of everyone who's listening, I think uh, Fred talked about Dave Snowden briefly. Uh, Dave Snowden will actually be talking at the Agile India conference that is on the 13th October uh, next month. Uh, we are at the end of this month, so you know another you know, 13 days. Uh, he's also doing a full day workshop if you're interested in really getting a deep dive. Uh, so do uh, check that out. Uh, and I'm sure uh, Fred is uh, accessible through the emails uh, through the email that he shared earlier. Uh, yeah. I do see one question here, a couple of questions actually. Uh, Fred, if you're okay, we'll take a couple of questions. Absolutely. Okay, cool. So I'll read out the question. Uh, Ankit uh, has asked a question saying, how many projects make bad choice of selecting microservices architecture just because it's fashionable? Uh, what is uh, your one key advice to avoid a bad choice? I would say about 80% of the use of microservices is probably wrong. Um, you know, part of sometimes they're wrong because they're not really microservices. Uh, they're not really small, very, I mean, you know, less than a thousand lines of code sort of things. Uh, they really are services. Now, service oriented architecture is a perfectly good architecture. To some degree, the architecture I showed you is a service architecture because my services are big, um, but they still have crisp boundaries. Uh, but I would say about 80% of the time that you hear that somebody's doing microservices, it's probably wrong. And probably half of that 80% is because you shouldn't be using microservices. And the other is they're not doing microservices really anyway. But it is pretty bad right now. And so what would be your one key advice to avoid that choice, the bad choice? Um, make sure you ask what problem are you trying to solve? Um, to some degree, technologists or even CTOs will come in and says, we want to do microservices. We're committed to doing microservices. And you need to educate them about that's not really a good answer for anything except the fuzzy problems. And unless you're some really weird startup in Silicon Valley, you're probably not doing, or even Bangalore, you're probably not doing fuzzy problems. Fuzzy problems are the ones that don't have answers. That's where you get AI solutions and things like that in there as well. But if you're doing a payroll system, it's not a good idea to guess how much money you're going to get this month. You probably want to really know the answer. Uh, and so, yeah, you know, microservices don't work very well in that environment. All right. Thanks, uh, Fred. Uh, the next question is from Vijay, uh, who's asking, microservices do help in keeping bounded contexts well established in a domain-driven design uh, on complicated problems and events uh, used across bounded contexts. Is that an anti-pattern? Uh, I think that is a good point, but I would say that we're, to some degree, we're using that in our architecture as well. So the, the interface to say the law portion of, my, of these components is actually very, very, very skinny. Um, all the internals about timelines and, all those, and payment periods and stuff like that's completely hidden from the outside world. Uh, and so I, and, and in terms of our outside world, we are basically publishing events back to the rest of the world. So we are expressing what we need and in information. So we're doing that very similar to that. So I, th I think the bounded context stuff is, is a good, good idea. So you want to make sure your bounded context are as small as possible, but not if it creates high coupling between pair of services. So if two services you know, have to have a very high bandwidth exchange to make their decision, you're definitely wasting your events like that. Your events bandwidth should be pretty narrow to that. So uh, a fat API is probably a sign that you have the wrong context boundaries. But absolutely make as many small ones as possible with as skinny of interfaces as you can possibly make them. Cool. I think, for example, in the, in the case of the sickness benefit, we have 320 classes. I think there's seven public classes in there. The rest of it is none of their damn business, pretty much. So that's about a context argument. And even within there, we do have context within there, but we, we create the context around package boundaries. So there's multiple modules involved, Kotlin modules involved in the even each, each component to help further isolate those. So congratulations on bounded context. Absolutely. Uh, that's what makes a long-lived application. Yep, totally makes sense. 
Uh, all right, I think we have uh, run out of questions and run out of time. So uh, thanks, Fred. I know it's late for you, but thanks for joining in. Well, you're welcome, and I appreciate the opportunity, and I do apologize for our technical glitches. Um, so hopefully look forward to seeing you guys, all you guys in more in person in one of these days soon. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Appreciate it. And uh, look forward to seeing you all on the 13th uh, when we have the main event. Thank you.